Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Startup Boston podcast, where I interview founders, investors, and influencers in the Boston startup community to uncover actionable advice and stories from their experiences. I'm your host, Nick Dupuy. This is the 39th episode of the podcast and is the second of three episodes in the San Diego mini series. Today, I'm talking with the very fascinating Kevin Kinsella, a venture capitalist in San Diego. Kevin's bio is long and deep, so I'll give you a few of the highlights. Kevin has been a part of the formation, financing, and development of more than 125 companies, including several public companies. In the past, Kevin has led international joint ventures for Solar Turbines International. He was an advisor to the Peruvian government in national nutrition planning, where he developed the first commercialization plan for quinoa ran a technology exchange program between the U.S. and Latin America, based in Mexico City, and taught algebra at the American High School in Beirut, Lebanon. He was also a guest op-ed columnist for the Boston Herald American. He is a member of the Circumnavigators Club, an elite group of explorers who have gone around the world in a continuous trip using multiple modes of transport. He won the Tony Award for producing the mega-hit Broadway musical Jersey Boys, and partnered with Rhino Records in producing the Grammy Award-winning Jersey Boys original cast recording, which has gone double platinum, selling over 2 million copies. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a member of the Broadway League. He also owns Kinsella Estates Winery, which produces the highest-rated premium Dry Creek Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. He has a large selection of art, sculptures, and memorabilia at his Kinsella Library in La Jolla, including his collection of California Pliant Air art, which is the second largest collection in the world. In today's episode, a few things Kevin talks about are the transition from employee to founder to investor, how the valuations of companies have changed over time, trends in venture capital that worry him, and a bit about Jersey Boys and his winery Kinsella Estates. If you like today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you can get all of the new episodes as soon as they're released right on your podcast app. And as always, you can find today's show notes at startupbostonpodcast.com, and you can reach me at nic at startupbostonpodcast.com. Enjoy today's episode. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure, Nick. It's uh, you know, a pleasure to be here in beautiful, sunny San Diego and uh, to have the, the chance to interview you here. Before we get started, can you give us a little background information about yourself? I graduated from MIT in 1967 with a bachelor's degree in management. I went immediately to graduate school at the School of Advanced International Studies of Johns Hopkins in Washington, D.C., and got a master's degree uh, in international relations from SICE, as it's called, uh, in May of 1969, and then... I had received a Rotary International Fellowship to study in Sweden, but it didn't begin immediately. It was the September following the September after I graduated. So there was a hiatus of about 15 months. And I used the opportunity of that time to take a teaching position at the American High School in Beirut, Lebanon, where I taught algebra for a year. And then I went to Sweden and uh, started the academic year there. After that, I returned to uh, the United States, and so we're now 1971, and I fairly soon took a position in Latin America, uh, heading up a teaching fellowship program that was based at Tufts University, but all the positions were in Latin America. And I was one of the executives of the program, and I was stationed in Mexico City for two years. I left that in 1974 and took a position with a consulting company called Transcentury, which had a contract with the Agency for International Development, or AID, uh, providing uh, nutrition consulting to the government of Peru. And while I was in Peru on this contract, uh, I developed the original marketing, international marketing and development program for what has now become a famous high-protein grain called quinoa, which at the time only grew above 10,000 feet. 
given the popularity of it, I'm sure they've developed hybrids that grow anywhere now. But back then, it was an indigenous crop to the Altiplano, and uh, you had to harvest it up there. So the program originally became a crop support program for the locals, and it saved massive amounts of foreign exchange that they would otherwise spend on wheat. And uh, you would substitute about 10% of wheat flour with quinoa flour. And since quinoa was 17% protein by weight, as opposed to only 7% for the highest quality of wheat, which is Trigal, uh, this was a major boost to the protein nutritional supplement for the local population in breads and pastas and cakes and so on. So that's what I did, and that took off later because of the fact that it's almost a complete food, and um, now it's... So expensive, apparently, that the local people can't even buy it. Oh, wow. Anyway, so sort of like what happened to corn after um, it became a biofuel uh, in the Midwest mm -hmm. and, and also going down to Mexico where the local people then couldn't buy the cornmeal or masa that they make tortillas out of because uh, it became too expensive because of the competition from the biofuel uh, use of the, of the grain. Then in... 1975, I went to back to MIT where I worked in the development office for three years until 1978, and I was in charge of all fundraising on the basically Colorado and West uh, for a major capital campaign that MIT was conducting at the time, and I completed that assignment uh, in 1978, so I was there for about three years. And that was my opportunity to pick up and move to California to do my entrepreneurial things that came fairly soon thereafter. Did you move to California specifically for that? I did. I got in my Pinto and I drove west with my $250, and I got a job originally with a fairly large corporation here, Solar Turbines International, which at the time was part of International Harvester Corporation out of Chicago. It later was purchased by Caterpillar Tractor out of Peoria, Illinois. And Solar made industrial gas turbine engines, which are used in pipeline transmission, they're used on oil platforms and uh, other industrial uses. Particularly in the oil and gas industry, they're useful because you can use the actual gas that almost always vents off of oil wells, and you use that as the fuel for these turbines. Therefore, it's, in effect, self-generation. So you don't have to bring in energy from the outside. You just use what is vented off from the, from the oil wells. And uh, I was in charge of all international joint ventures, barter, and counter trade. Did that until 19... 81 when I started my first company, Spectre Graphics Corporation, in San Diego. I started a company with three other MIT guys, and then started another company in Houston in 1982 called Landmark, and Landmark was in the business of taking geophysical data that had been accumulated uh, while they, they call it shoot lines for oil and gas exploration, and it's it's basically setting off measured explosions at intervals along the Earth's surface and where these are intersecting uh, at 90-degree angles and measuring what happens with geophones that, in effect, listen to the Earth and catch the reflections. So then the utility of that is you can sort of figure out what's deep down below okay. based on the reflectivity of the various layers and the strength of the downward pulse of, of energy from the, the mini explosion. Mm -hmm. And that way you can map the clines and anticlines, which give you an indication of where there could be pockets of um, natural gas or oil. And uh, we uh, perfected that system and you know, began selling them. And it was the first big data company, basically, because there's massive amounts of data that you had to process and pre-process before you put it through our algorithms. Um, and uh, it was it went public, and then it was later acquired by 
Halliburton, the major geophysical services firm in Texas. So it's done very well, still exists to this day, still very cutting edge technology. So you've gone, and now you're an investor, so you've gone from employee to founder and then to investor. Can you talk a little bit about what sparked each of those transitions for you? So from employee to founder, that really happened in 1981 when I put together this company with other MIT people. So I was no longer an employee, and I was the founder of a company, and uh, I remember thinking how cool it was to be sitting around in my living room around the coffee table, you know, spitballing ideas from the new company back and forth. And then a month or so later, there was a receptionist who would answer the phone, Spectrographics, which is the name that we had concocted sitting in my living room. And so I thought that was kind of neat. It's a real affirmation that you've done something. Uh, and then the company took out a terrific project, which was beating IBM at its own game. IBM finally decided that, gee, this is a smart thing to do. So we're not going to give Spectrographics a monopoly on it. And uh, so they started m making the same color raster workstation that would display CADM drawings. CADM is a CAD CAM proprietary software program that was manufactured by Lockheed Corporation. And all of the major defense contractors used it because you would be able to sketch out parts and fuselages and um, and, and other um, you know significant parts of large um, you know, vessels or vehicles or spaceships or airplanes or whatever. So we, through our programming and through the fact that we were programming directly to the, the screen on the display, we were able to make a great impact on the field and so you could do on our system in color, 3D color, that was persistent and not faded like when a stroker, a calligraphy display, sketches something out. It goes on and does the next one because you had the phosphorescence and that will um, basically go away after a while. And so your notion of the, of the picture of the photo disappears. So what then sparked your interest to go from instead of founding another company to becoming an investor? So it was the next logical step, which was how do I leverage this exciting experience of starting one company to be able to go and start others? Because I was seeing opportunities all around. And so I guess so then the first company that I approached with a pure investment hat on, as well as being a co-founder, was Landmark Graphics Corporation. So I I was in Houston, and I met a guy who, um, he was aware of the advances in computer science and in powerful standalone terminals. He thought that they would be perfect to do the geophysical exploration that he was interested in. So I paired him together uh, with a couple of scientists, and uh, software scientists, and he Loved it. And then we got a CEO, experienced CEO who came out of deck, and so we put the company together. I got some outside investors in it. And, uh, you know, it took off, and uh, that was landmark, and went public and was later acquired. So uh, I was delighted by that. And then I went to some friends in, actually, an MIT colleague of mine, John Freeman, and he'd been in the real estate business in Washington. And I pitched him this idea of him and his partner diversifying into venture capital by backing me because I had started these two companies by myself. So if I had backing and I could do this full time, then the, I could start more companies. Mm. So they thought that was a splendid idea. And so they backed me in my first fund, which was about $400,000. And uh, it, I was very fortunate to be able to turn that into about $4 million. It became a 10-bagger. And that was that was a good start to things. <laughs> so you need need a little a little fortuitousness, a little luck every once in a while. So Avalon one performed great, and then we did a second Avalon, and we brought in other limited partners. And third Avalon, by the third Avalon, some of the major blue chip venture funds in the Bay Area were participating as limited partners, and Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia Capital. Mm -hmm. um, NEA got into it, um, 
and uh, TVI, uh, and then later Verse Adventures. And so it was quite a good and, and expanding group. So they became the limited partners of Avalon. Um, and we continued to do a mixture of tech and biotech, Avalon, you know, two, three, four. And then we decided, my partner Larry Bach and I decided we wanted to go beyond just getting management fee, you know, stakes from these large venture funds. We wanted to own, have our, a, a proper fund to run that had limited partners just like the venture funds did, just like Kleiner Perkins did in Sequoia and Benchmark and so on. So we went out into the institutional market to do that. And, you know, they're pretty hostile to newcomers, and uh, we didn't find great footing there, a little bit here and there. So, you know, things just went on from there, and the funds got, you know, larger and more sophisticated, and we got more limited partners. And until 1991, when we were about to raise Avalon 5, uh, we were in New York, and we had scheduled an appointment to see Novartis, well, at the time it was Sandoz Pharmaceutical Corporation. They shared office space, an executive suite on Fifth Avenue in Rockefeller Center with a bunch of other uh, Swiss-centered companies uh, so that when their executives were in New York, they had secretarial help, they had offices and desks, and they had fax machines and conference rooms and computer terminals and so forth. So that's where we met, and the idea was we were going to pick up Sandoz as a limited partner in the new fund that Larry Bach and I were starting, which would have been Avalon 5. And uh, after hearing our pitch, the three people there from Sandoz asked to be excused, and they left the room and came back and said, uh, you know, I don't know what you guys think about this, but what would you think if we agreed to do your whole fund? Wow. So that was the end of the fundraising, right? Mm. If we agreed. And we agreed. We're easy. Uh, because we had earlier that day, we had the experience of sitting in a conference room at Abbott Capital. And this is the day before iPads or MacBook Pros or whatever. So people took notes on long yellow pads, legal pads. And I remember explaining exactly what we did and how we founded companies and we're always on the lookout for innovative technologies by reading the scientific literature, by attending conferences. So Sandoz decided to back it. We thought it was a great idea. It was an unusually good deal because we asked for a carried interest of 50%. The normal carried interest is 20%. Sometimes you can get 30 but we asked for 50%. And... Um, they they agreed because they were not financially motivated. They were motivated by the our ability to create companies that would develop drugs that they could then partner with or later acquire mm -hmm. the company. So okay. they had different motivation than we did, as opposed to strict financial return in the in the short term. Yeah. So they were okay with splitting the profits fifty fifty, and that was remarkable. It turned out that that was a, became an eleven x fund. So we returned eleven times the money that we were. You know, given to invest, and having a 50% carry in that kind of return is a very large carry. So that really put us on the map. We retired, actually, after that. Larry Bach, myself, and John Hendrick after Avalon 5, which was known as, as Avalon Medical Partners. And the band didn't get back together until 2001, when I hooked up with a guy named Steve Tomlin uh, here in San Diego. And Steve and I had met... Uh, you know, at some of these uh, angel events that I would get invited to all the time, where there was a robust angel network in and around San Diego, you know, back during the first internet boom. It all, of course, blew up in the year 2000, but in 99 and, and 2000, before, you know, the cock crowed <laughs> on the deal, <laughs> there was just a lot of angel money, and they would have these forums, and entrepreneurs would come and pitch their ideas, and you would sit there and it was like the gong show, I suppose, and you know, see if it you, you liked any things that they pitched, and if they did, a deal could be done. If you didn't, eh, that was the end of them. So um, we we enjoyed that. Things you know went on from there. We successfully raised Avalon 
is 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and we're now in 11. So after the hiatus in the year 2001, we were able to raise Avalon 6, and then we sort of went along, and the funds kept getting bigger, and then a couple years later, we added a couple more partners, and uh, we grew, but always we were principals. We were not we weren't looking to hire associates or assistant vice presidents. We're looking for basically, you know, partners mm-hmm. uh, who there was mutual respect for the, each other's accomplishments and advice was freely given, but it was knowledgeable and competent advice. And um, you know, so things things went went swimmingly from then on. Does the way that you approach biotech investing differ from the way you approach uh, investing in other tech companies? I mean, fundamentally, we like to get in the ground floor where you're getting a software engineer or a mechanical engineer or someone who's got an idea that they want to commercialize, but you're not a backing from their organization and you end up having them, you know, peel out and ideally f- uh, peel out full time. So you can then form companies around them and let the company grow and hire other top talent and so forth. So we've done that, I mean, virtually consistently since the inception of the fund. It's our distinguishing characteristic so that there's always, there's always a fresh ideas and there's, you know, new blood and people to back and we would grow the idea until a point where we would then bring in other venture funds who would back the companies and we would take our exits as you normally would in the venture business so they either go public or they become acquired and then we would you know keep going and start other companies we ran out of investment funds for that fund we would raise the next fund so we just kept going that way since you you founded companies yourself has that influenced you as an investor since you've been on both sides? Yeah, I mean, I, we, we try to be reasonable with regard to deal terms. We're not hyper-aggressive with anybody, and we don't want to be taken advantage of either on the other side. We want a deal that's fair and it's not too good or too bad, and that's the way we like to do business. Because at the end of the day, if you're too predatory in the terms that you're trying to drive, the entrepreneurs are not going to stick around, or they won't even do the deal to begin with, because they'll recognize that all the financial reward is you know, going out to the venture capitalists, not to them. And you want everyone to feel part of the story, and part of being the hero in it. So that's very important for us to feel good about ourselves and, the, and about the relationships that we've started with the entrepreneurs. Are there any trends with venture capital that uh, might worry you? Yes, and they're a constant worry because it's cyclical. And that is the intrinsic worth of a deal is what you're investing in. So, and usually if you're investing in a startup, it's an idea, probably not even with filed intellectual property patents yet. So it's a couple of guys or girls or both sitting around a conference table with their smiles, their resumes, and their slideware. So there has to be a reasonable expectation of what that's worth to get together with people, say we're going to start a company and this is our idea and we have a PowerPoint and here it is. That has to be something that's reasonable. In in our mind, it's, it's not reasonable to be a figure that's in double digits. Uh, it's in... For us, it's in the low single, you know, millions, if you will, if that. But there's been inflation. What's happened, and it's terrible for returns, is the valuation of venture deals has been determined not by the intrinsic worth of the idea and the people, but rather by the availability of capital. So if there's like a ton of capital, then you command this lofty valuation. And the problem with that is as a venture investor is you won't own enough of the company percentage-wise that when you get a liquidity event, you will make a significant return on your money. Because in venture capital, investments have to be symmetrical. Your downside is you lose all your money. So your upsides has to be you can make infinite amount of money. If it's not, if your upside is capped, 
then you're as an asset class, it's not going to make money over time. That's just the way it works. It's also a reason why investing in entertainment is an extremely hazardous enterprise because there, the, the, the downside for an investment in a movie, an indie film, or a Broadway show, or something of that nature, uh, the downside is the same as in a high-tech venture. You lose all your money. But the upside is not the same. The upside is different. The upside mm-hmm. is capped. You never or verily ever make 10 times your money on a, you know, a film or a Broadway show, something like that. It has to be really spectacularly successful. Uh, you can make 10 times your money in a venture or biotech investment, and the investment has only been moderately successful. So it is a completely different yardstick whereby these things are, are measured. It, it's, um, it, it, you have to select carefully the types of investments that you make knowing that the returns, if you are successful, have to be symmetrical with the losses if you're not successful. And many investors never consider that. It's just, oh, this is great. There's a syndicate forming. I got to get in it. It's a hot deal. The people are hot and so on and so forth. And they will invest in things notwithstanding the price, which is crazy. Going back to the the cyclical nature of investing, where are we today on that? I think we've come off the crazy unicorn valuations. We're not back to normal. There's still a ton of money whose alternative return was T-bills or money market funds, which are terrible. So they were looking to venture to bolster those returns. And it became a self-fulfilling prophecy because they would invest in overvalued companies, hoping the greater fool theory would obtain so that there'd be another investor thinking it was as crazily successful high valuation as as they did, or, or even more, and they could even sell to those investors, <laughs> make a pop before anything had happened, right? It's like every, people taking each other's laundry. I, I still think that that's there. It's ameliorated, I think, a bit, particularly in software, where the number of services that you can summon on your iPhone and where that becomes, for the owners of the app, a profitable business is now vanishingly small because there's no revenue model, there's no growth path, there's no, you know, no way to figure out, you know, okay, well, how do you get 50 million users off uh, right out the shoot? Very mm-hmm. difficult. So I think things are changing, and I think there's what's crazy. There's an increasing interest in Silicon Valley now in biotech for a couple of reasons. One. Because I think they've, you know, blown their wad on these sort of crazy apps where you, you know, have meetups or you're doing something that's not that significant and the revenue model is not completely obvious. And so they're getting away from that. They're still doing enterprise applications. AI, artificial intelligence, become very big as an app area. It's probably the next wave of investments after cloud computing. We did very well in cloud computing at Avalon, and we're starting to make investments in deep AI, and I think those will pay off as well. That's another meme that's going on. There's been so much money raised by some of the significant funds like Andreessen Horowitz in the Bay Area that they're just not finding the outlets in technology to invest that money. And so they're inclined to invest money because large amounts are required. And so they can you know, push a huge number of stacks of chips across the table. Uh, and also, they, they somehow think that biotech, it, you just move the focal point of a tech investment and then, you know, we just play the same principles and so on. And there, you, you know, then you can be successful in biotech. I think it's a terrible fallacy. Uh, biotech is very different. And if you're looking at the company that's going to make a therapeutic product, there's this thing called the FDA that stands in your way, <laughs> and which is very, very expensive, you know, to get approval from the FDA for a, a new drug. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not like getting an underwriter's laboratory seal of approval for an electronic device. Yeah, much more different, much more, much different than that. Let's talk a little bit about San Diego and the startup scene here. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about how the startup scene here has changed over time. I think the sad story about San Diego is that it's basically become a build-to-buy city, which is the entrepreneurs who start things here expect them to be acquired. 
by a big boy somewhere. So there's not a lot of internal company building that goes on. The last significant technology company in San Diego was founded in 1985. So that's more than 30 years ago. Is that Qualcomm? No, that's Qualcomm. There hasn't been a company of that scale or size here since then. Contrast that with the Bayer at Silicon Valley. Intel, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, Instagram. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. There are dozens of companies like that. Here in this town, for whatever reason, the critical mass to have enterprises stay and build themselves into significant suppliers of whatever just has not caught hold. Combination of a lot of things, one of which could be weather, and certainly that it's just it's not oppressive enough to make <laughs> people want to put their heads down and work through the night. It's too nice outside. Mm-hmm. I want to talk a little bit about Jersey Boys. Can you tell me a little bit about your role with Jersey Boys and how you first got involved with it? Mm-hmm. So I'm the largest investor in the show. It was a wonderful stroke of luck. It came about because I've been a supporter of the Hoya Playhouse for many years, you know, donating money to them. And you would have special privileges. One of them was you could get to, would go to technical rehearsals, which are basically closed to the public. And in a technical rehearsal, you have an entire theater interspersed in the seats of the theater are probably 25 Mac computers on tabletops. Obviously, since of the slope of the proscenium, you have the, the tables that the Mac computers are on, the legs are longer in the front than they are in the back. So, you know, to make everything level. You get to sit in only a few areas for a tech rehearsal because if it's a tech near the time of going into preview, you're going to want to have photographers shooting B-roll of the cast. I went to a tech rehearsal in October of 04 for this show based on the life of Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. I had some dinner with friends beforehand, shared a couple of bottles of wine. The curtain was late. Uh, it was going to be 9 o'clock for the tech. Normally, curtains are at 8 o'clock. So it's getting pretty, you know, late in the day, in the evening. And some people said, well, Kevin, you're going to fall asleep. Why don't, you, why, don't you, why don't we just not go to this thing? And I said, well, here's the deal. We'll, we'll go, and if I fall asleep at, you know, in the first act, then we'll go home in intermission. And then at least they're, the friends are already there, and they're not going to kick them out. They could stay mm-hmm. for the whole thing. But show begins, first downbeat of music. I'm absolutely in this price. I think it's the best Broadway show I've ever seen. At intermission, I go to the director, <clears throat> Des McEnough, who was also at the time the artistic director of the Playhouse, and say, Des, this is the best show I've ever seen. I I don't do this for a living, but I got to invest in this. It's just, I just know it's going to kill him when it goes to Broadway. And he said, like many people, the project was fully subscribed. Well, in other words, they'd raised all the capital, but he, the executive producer was coming up that weekend, and he really wanted to sit down to meet them. After the initial chit-chat, we sat down at the table. He puts his hands up, spread fingers and he goes around looking at everyone in the room, and he says, I need to tell you, you could lose all your money. <laughs> so I said, I'm in. <laughs> in venture, no one ever tells you that. They tell you quite the opposite. A bunch of BS about making 10 times your money overnight or doubling it in some very short period of time and so on. I mean, the BS gets so thick, sometimes you need to, you feel you need to go take a shower afterwards. In this case, here's an honest guy telling me this is a very risky business. You could lose all your money in investing in this show. And, but I'd seen the show, and I loved it, and I just knew it was going to kill him. So I invested. And uh, by happenstance, that summer, um, so this was October 2004, and then in the summer of 2005 was when we finally got a Broadway theater for the fall and so we're starting rehearsals in new york for the cast and three weeks before the rehearsals were supposed to start i get a phone call from the executive producer michael david the guy with the noah beard uh, informing me that an asian investor i think it was someone who's from japan 
had dropped out of the capitalization at the last minute for no reason. And this person was providing a million dollars of the capitalization. And um, so I'm thinking, geez, I've seen the show already. It's fantastic. It, and I'm not the only one who thinks that because it would have opened at the Playhouse. It just killed all the records uh, for the box office. It was extended three times. Uh, it just was unbelievably superb. And so I'm sort of thinking. And so anyway, it didn't take me too long to tell Michael David, you know, I think I'll take all of it. So in, in other words, it wasn't as if, yeah, Michael will help you out. I'll take 100000 and then you can go around and get the rest. No, I said, I'll take the whole thing. So I did. So then I, beca- I became the largest investor in the show and uh, Michael's best friend. And, you know, I got to, you know, invest in the Grammy Award winning Broadway in, uh, original, you know, cast recording. Um, and it's all been great. <laughs> 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 Some people can't say that same with investing yeah. on Broadway. 85% of Broadway shows don't even return a nickel. Really? It's, it's unbelievable. Well, Obviously, that's not an economic investment there has to be other reasons people like to be associated with supporting the arts and right if they have a shot to win a tony award at some point regardless of how many swings of the bat that takes they they want to do what they want to play mm-hmm. um so i understand that but that's not why i'm doing did you expect it to win a tony award i just knew it was a great show i certainly expected to to make money when the tony always helps because that's a seal of approval mm-hmm. that is stamped on the on the production that is always then referred to in advertising or other promotions about the show. So, yeah, that was great. Winning the Tony. Now, you also own a winery as well, Kinsella Estates I do. Winery. Yeah. Um, so, where does your, your love for wine come from? It comes from some friends, uh, Ralph and Gail Bryan, who introduced me to fine wine in the late. 90s, I guess, mid to late 90s, and to get above going to Trader Joe's and buying your wine, someone has to trust your palate that what they really love and appreciate and are are spending serious money on, that you will also love. So it requires that sort of buddy relationship that someone sincerely feels that you're, it's not going to be throwing pearls before swine when they let you taste their you know, four hundred dollar bottle of Chateau Montrose or Pichon Lalande or something like that, mm-hmm. and then you get hooked, and they explain what they find really attractive about this wine, how it differs from a much younger wine typically that you buy off the shelf, and so on. So, so the, those that that couple really was my initiation into fine wine, and then I just continued to add to the knowledge beyond that. The story of the winery is. It's a 4-H project gone horribly wrong, and uh, I, I went to Healdsburg basically to enjoy the good weather when the uh, ocean uh, fog marine layer would come into San Diego in the summer, Okay, because right here on the coast, uh, it, it can be have a high cloud layer for the whole summer, and in fact, in the year 2000, I don't think there was a summer. So I decided I can't stand this. And so some friends said, oh, this is a great little town in Sonoma. There's a wonderful wine and food culture. It's sunny there all the time in the summer. It gets a tad hot in the afternoon. But if you go out and do your activities in the morning, you know, by the time afternoon ro- rolls around, you'd be more than happy to sit at the pool at the, the Hillsborough Hotel and all that. Four years later, I get a call. And because uh, I, I didn't want to hire a broker to look for a vineyard property. It was just if something fell in my lap, that was really great, you know, and that was it. So this fell in my lap. They said these people have discerning taste in a lot of things, particularly in wine and winemaking. And they said that they would they would have died to buy the property themselves, but they couldn't afford it. So I took a ride around it with, with Jan Forth, one of the owners of the other vineyard. And I just fell in love with the place, particularly the big redwood forests. How does the, the wine business differ from other forms of business? There's, there's good news and bad news. The good news is when a customer orders your wine on release, you get to process their credit card right away. So, in fact, you get their money before you've even shipped the wine to them. Mm. So, in order to be able to do that, I have to have enormous upfront expenditures. I've got to 
pay vineyard management to grow the grapes. Things happen during the summer and irrigation has to be turned on and um, so forth. And then the fruit is hanging. It gets harvested. It gets vinified, turned into wine. No mistakes can happen there. And then it goes into three quarters French oak barrels. And then it is bottled. And then it's laid down for a year. So I need to figure out how to short circuit that that process because every time I do something, it creates it accrues an expense, and those expenses are never fully liquidated or realized until the inventory is ultimately sold. So there's a huge working capital need to be able to run a profitable vineyard, and a lot of people are surprised by that. I want to go now into our rapid fire questions. Okay. So the first one is, what's a startup in San Diego that you're excited about? Empire is a emerging uh, company, basically affinity um, trafficking, where it started off as um, uh, restaurants, where you would go in and you would sign up through your credit card, so that every time you had a meal there, you would get points. You would be able to redeem those points at that restaurant or another restaurant on the program. So it was a, a cash back kind of a scheme, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, they now have expanded considerably and are doing deals with the huge credit card companies with Amazon and so forth because they command now a database of a half a, half a billion, I think, you know, people and organizations who want to buy whatever they're buying cheap. What advice would you give your 20-year-old self? You know, I, I'm, I'm happy for the experiences that I've had. I think some of them were essential to, you know, mature my outlook on the world. A lot of the experiences came from living in foreign countries where every day is a challenge, whether it's language or custom or weather or something. It's not like living with mom and dad and having you know, <laughs> having your breakfast brought to your room on a tray or something. So that, that and you know, when you're challenged every day, you have to be adaptive and you have to be clever. You have to think of workarounds and how I'm going to solve this problem and all that stuff. So I wouldn't exchange that experience for anything because I think it was essential. You know, I think I made the right choice in going to MIT because – you're not going to, you can learn other skills later in life. You can learn art appreciation later in life. You're not going to learn quantum physics later in life. Or it's very rare that you find that. For a lot of reasons, it's very hard to go find where it's being taught, <laughs> number one. And number two, uh, you know, a- after a period of time, your bla- I don't think your brain is as flexible in understanding abstract engineering or scientific concepts as easily uh, as it was when you're back, you know, uh, 18 to 20. What are some tools that help make your life and work easier? Interconnected devices, I suppose. Well, I I think everyone's got to give great credit to healthcare in our country today, which I think is pretty awesome compared to what what you get in the rest of the world. What are some of your favorite books? The, the book, it's, it's political, but it's about Huey Long, um, and uh, I think it's called it's called Kingfisher. Okay, and um, it's just a fantastic book about politics in the South. And uh, Long was a serious threat to Roosevelt in '36, uh, sort of a populist Southerner that would eat into the support of the patrician New York uh, former governor. His candidacy never happened. Uh, because he was assassinated on the steps of the Louisiana State House in Baton Rouge by a disgruntled consult uh, constituent or something. Mm. So that you know, we'll never know what might have happened there. But uh, anyway, the book I think is fascinating to read about all of that. What was the um, guy who died of pancreatic cancer? He wrote a wonderful book. He was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, um, and it was oh, um, the last lecture. The last lecture. Yes, right. I love that book. Yeah, I thought that was terrific. Yes. Uh, really made you appreciate life and what to do and yep. carpe diem and all of that, which I think is true today as when he wrote it. And he's 
Yeah. He's got to have been dead, you know, 10 years. Um, mm-hmm. August 1914 by Barbara Tuckman, I think, is a wonderful book of history showing disaster that the world descended into with the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo. And, um, you know, this was June of, of um, 1914. And just how all these powers sort of lined up their armies, their egos, started mobilizing. It's very hard to unplug all of that. And then the carnage of World War I was just absolutely terrible. Three, four empires were destroyed. The world has never been the same uh, since since that time. In a geopolitical sense, more happened in World War I than happened in World War II. <coughs> the whole world changed completely. The British lost its empire. The Ottoman Empire, which was enormous, basically completely disintegrated. The, the Russian Empire collapsed. Uh, communism took hold for 50 years before it to disintegrate on its own. And the German um, Empire basically was collapsed in and of itself and then it reemerged in you know first in the Weimar Republic which was a disaster and then then later in Nazism and, and all the horrors of the world that caused. So anyway, so trying to understand the roots of, of that and uh, I think it's it's important. Just a couple of final questions here to close out. Sure. So the first one is where can people find out more about Avalon Ventures? From our website, so it's uh, avalon-ventures.com and uh, lots of information about us and our portfolio company. Okay. And the final question is, do you have any parting thoughts, advice, or suggestions for the audience? Carpe diem and do your thing. Everyone needs to, at a, at a certain point, you don't want to do it too early, you don't want to do it too late, you got to stop working for the man. You got <laughs> to do something for yourself. And that's what gives you the great rewards. That's what Hemingway said. What, what, and he loved writing about people who would, would do this, which is to say, it didn't matter a damn what they were paid. As long as they loved just doing it, mm-hmm. uh, those are the type of people that he found to be sort of exciting to write about. And he admired them, which comes through, I think, in his writing. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been a, a real pleasure talking Good. to you. Nick, thanks for having me. If you liked today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. You'll get all my new episodes as soon as they're released right on your podcast app. And if you really liked today's episode, it would mean a lot to me if you could write a review of the podcast as well. Just go to startupbostonpodcast.com slash iTunes. And remember, you can find all show notes with links at startupbostonpodcast.com. Until next time, if you have any feedback, ideas for guests, or just want to say hi, you can reach me at nic at startupbostonpodcast.com. Or reach out on Twitter at Startup Bosscast. That's Startup B-O-S-Cast. Cheers.